young people. Continuing the education on exigency. It sounds simple, but when you get into how the courts are going to view things, you need to you need to be like a midget at a urinal, always on your toes. Here we go. Fisher versus the city of San Jose. Uh, did exigent circumstances justify a warrantless entry into Fisher's apartment to arrest him? Now, remember, when you're entering someone's home, exigency has to be immediate and it has to be warrantless, meaning you don't have time to go get a warrant. All right. Facts. At about midnight, so we're talking about in the middle of the night, a security guard at an apartment complex in San Jose. San Jose has got some, man, that's a crazy town, let me tell you. Huge police department, lots of materials. They got better shit than most federal agencies. Really good agency to work for. Bob, Bobby B, if you heard him on my show a couple times, he used to work for San Jose. Anyway, San Jose was walking by Fisher's apartment when he saw him inside and motioned for him to step out. It appears the guard wanted to talk to him about a noisy neighbor. When Fisher walked outside, he was carrying a rifle and moving it around in various positions. At one point, he might have aimed it at the guard. Oh my God, horrible. Fisher was generally unresponsive and apparently intoxicated. Well, you obviously went to his house, got him come out, and he came out. He wasn't that unresponsive, but I digress. He also kept talking about his Second Amendment rights. The guard notified a supervisor who called San Jose Police. Oh, shit. It's about to get real. The situation developed as follows. Times are approximate. Midnight. Officers began arriving. Eventually, 60 were called in. This is what happens when you have an agency like San Jose that's got hundreds and I don't know how many damn officers they got. But when, when shit happens in San Jose, there's never a shortage of officers. Arriving. Eventually, 60 were called in. 60 officers for a guy who was in his house and a guard called him outside and he might have aimed the gun at the guard. 60 officers. Welcome to California. Okay. Uh, while standing at the door of his apartment, Fisher spoke with an officer in a rambling fashion at about, about his Second Amendment rights. A little later, Fisher's wife walked outside and told officers that he had about 18 rifles in the apartment. Why would a wife go out and tell that on her husband? Is she trying to get him killed? Does she just get a new insurance policy and that's why she went out? I don't get it. But anyway, police negotiator tried to speak with Fisher. He threatened to shoot her. And eh, that could be a problem. When you start threatening to shoot people, now you're increasing their exigency level and they can kind of do a lot. Officer saw Fisher walking around with a rifle in his hand. So what? He's in his house, but he threatened to shoot her. Now he's got a rifle in his hands. Those are connected. Independently, those may be different, but they're connected. An officer saw him point out, an officer saw him point one of his rifles toward two officers twice between 2.45 and 4. Now, now remember, this started at midnight. 60 officers arrived, and they have been talking to this guy. At 2.45, he pointed at him, and they didn't shoot him. And at 4 a.m., he pointed at him, and they didn't shoot him. All these things matter. Totality of the circumstances. An officer saw Fisher move the rifle around his apartment. So what? Fisher repeatedly told officers to go away and leave him alone. San Jose PD ain't going away because you tell them to leave. You, 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 that ain't going to happen. Officers saw Fisher apparently loading the rifle. Ooh. Officers began asking Fisher to leave his apartment with no response. The complex was evacuated. Okay? Now, remember, I want you to remember this time frame. Because remember, exigency is when you don't have time to get a warrant. It started at 12. He did this at 2 and 4. We're now at 6.23 a.m. Officers saw him loading the rifle at 6.30 a.m., Officers began asking officially no response. So we have been at this for over six hours and nobody has got a warrant. And we'll get into that a little bit later. The complex was evacuated at 7.30. Started at midnight, 7.30, 60 officers. They're evacuating to keep the pesky citizens safe. At 9 a.m., <laughs> nine hours later, officers broke the sliding glass door to the apartment 
and tossed in a phone. No response. Two hours later, 11 a.m., officers tossed in a flashbang into the apartment. No response. At 1 p.m., two hours later, now we're at 13 hours this has been going on, officers tossed in a CS gas canister into the apartment. No response. At 2 p.m., an hour after this, 2 p.m., Fisher exited and was arrested. Yay! The police did a great job. 60 officers, 12 hours later, they got him out and arrested him. Wow, and they didn't shoot anybody. Didn't kill anybody in the neighborhood. Freaking amazing. Let's find out what happened. After pleading no contest to a misdemeanor, people, a misdemeanor charge, 60 officers, 13 hours, apartment complex evacuated. A misdemeanor charge of brandishing a firearm. Fisher sued the city. <laughs> I, li I like Fisher. I don't, I don't even know this guy and I like him. <laughs> he did all this shit, tied up all these officers, told him to screw off all night, came out and got a misdemeanor, and now he's suing him. Fisher's my man. All right. He claimed, claiming the officer's actions constituted an un- lawful arrest in violation of his Fourth Amendment rights, the jury reached a new unanimous verdict. The officers had not violated his Fourth Amendment rights. Okay? He sued. The jury said, no way. Remember, in a jury trial, when you sue, that's civil. The level of proof is very low. You only have to tip the scales of justice in your way. Whereas a criminal trial, you have to get 12 jurors to agree unanimously to convict you. So much higher burden in criminal than civil. But the trial judge, U.S. Magistrate Patricia Thumball, <laughs> Thumball <laughs> overturned the jury, even though they unanimously said no way, the judge overturned the verdict, ruling that Fisher had been unlawfully arrested because the officer should have obtained an arrest warrant at some point before they arrested him. Okay. I, I mean, first of all, I think Judge Patricia probably is an idiot. But I kind of with her on this ruling because they had like 13 hours. They could have went and got a warrant. I mean, it's not that hard. Your Honor, we have a guy that was being drunk and disorderly. He armed himself. He threatened to shoot one of our, our uh, negotiators. He's pointed the weapon at us. We're pretty sure we're going to have to go in and force entry to arrest him. We would like a warrant to go in and arrest him. That would have been a very simple warrant, and they could have had one of the 60 officers go take care of that. And they didn't. Why? Well, because probably some of the officers were delivering donuts, and some of the officers were grabbing lunch, and we had to bring on extra shift, and they were getting overtime, and they were sitting in their cars playing their games, and sitting on, you know, and they were telling pesky citizens to get out and while they were kicking people out of their homes, they were probably recognizing people with warrants and arresting other people. I mean, look, this was a great fishnet for the law enforcement. But I digress. Here we go. So the judge said, I don't care what the verdicts, I don't care what the jurors said. They arrested him. They should have got a warrant. The judge then awarded Fisher nominal damages, $1. Why do you think the judge gave this $1? My regular viewers will know this. The people that don't watch me won't know it. Because in a civil trial, if you get $1 award, the pesky citizen who sued and went through all the bullshit gets $1. But the attorney fees are paid by the person you're suing. So by the judge giving this nut, nut $1, all his attorney fees were paid. So although it was it sounds like a $1 case, it could have been a $200,000 case. The guy got $1 and the attorney got $199,000 for his uh, services. So that's why civil trials, when the, when, the, when the attorney's arguing, even if you don't think my client deserves a lot of money, at least give him a dollar for his inconvenience. And a lot of juries will give a dollar because they have no clue. They just paid the attorney his fat check. But I digress. Let's get back to it. the judge awarded Fisher $1 and ordered the police department to train its officers better on the laws she thought they violated. Wow. All righty. 
Discussion. The issue on appeal. Why did, why did this get appealed? Because they didn't want to pay the attorney fees. The issue on appeal in Ninth Circuit was essentially as follows. Was Fisher arrested inside his apartment or only after he exited? So what they're arguing is, was he under quasi-arrest when you surrounded his house for 13 hours and ordered him out and followed him and talked to him and broke his window and threw in a flashbang and threw in tear gas? Was this guy really not in custody long before he stepped out of the house? I would say he was in custody. Okay, but the, nor the law normally is custody doesn't incur until the officer puts physical hands on you. Until you're in handcuffs, you're not in physical custody. You can't be charged with arrest or resisting arrest if you run from the cops if they didn't grab. You have to pull away and show some resistance that the officer had you in his custody before you can be charged with escaping custody or resisting. All right? All right. If he was arrested inside... Did the officers violate the rule of Peyton versus New York by entering a home without a warrant? I think this was clear exigency. I don't have a problem with them entering. I know somebody's going to call me a jackboot, but whatever. Where was Fisher arrested? Although Fisher was physically arrested outside his apartment, the court ruled that a de facto, that's the word I was looking for when I said quasi, a de facto arrest occurred inside when he was ordered to exit. Right. Why? Because the police exerted authority. They said, you're surrounded, you need to exit, we're either going to take you into custody when you come out, or we're going to come in and get you. That was a de facto arrest. I agree. The ruling was based on the earlier Ninth Circuit case, U.S. versus Alawaza, in which the court said, because the police had completely surrounded the appellate's trailer, oh, he lived in a trailer, damn, that's why they were picking on him, and with their weapons drawn and ordered him through a bullhorn to leave the trailer, the arrest occurred while he was still inside the trailer. Hmm. Thus, the court in Fisher ruled that in a standoff situation such as this one, any seizure takes place inside the home for patent purposes as opposed to outside of it because the police officers, though through their coercion action, constructively entered into the person's home and forced him outside to be taken into custody. I kind of agree with that. When you surround a house with guns, and you tell him, you have to come out, we ain't going away, you're under arrest, I think you're under arrest. Just because they haven't put hands on you, I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with the court here. Were there exigent circumstances? Because Fisher was arrested inside a home, the reality for the officers to enter depended on whether they complied with Peyton, which says the officers may not enter a suspect's home to arrest him without a warrant or consent I say that a lot. Remember, only three ways cops get in your house. Warrant, consent, or exigency. Without a warrant or consent, unless there was no time to obtain a warrant due to exigency. Nah, this is where they're going to lose me. There was no exigency when you hold a guy for 13 hours and you say you didn't have time to get a warrant and you've got 60 officers on scene and you say you didn't have time to break one away to go get a warrant. I call bullshit. I, 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 I would disagree with this. Did exigency exist? The jury unanimously found they did They did because Fisher was arrested at or before 6.30 a.m. when he was ordered to step out. Two, the situation at the time was still in a precarious early stages. I don't know about that. 6.30 is six and a half hours later. Is that early stages? Eh, I'm not sure I buy that one. The court, however, viewed things quite differently. Although it agreed that Fisher was arrested at 6.30 a.m., it ruled that he was also technically arrested at least three times after that. And because there had been time to obtain a warrant, I agree, before these later arrests, there were no accident circumstances, which meant the entire, the entries resulting from these arrests were unlawful. I don't know if I agree with that. The court analysis based on the Supreme Court, California v. Gerardo, in which the court ruled that if an arrestee, if an arrested suspect temporarily escapes custody, from the officers, he is not in custody until he is recaptured. Based on Houdini, the court ruled that after arresting Fisher was arrested, or after Fisher was arrested at 6.30, he escaped because he continued to go about his business in his apartment. 
He was then rearrested at seven when the officers broke the glass door and tossed in a phone. But again, he escaped when he continued to go about his business. I mean, this is just this is some serious lawyering going on here. The third arrest occurred at about 1 p.m. when the officers set off the CS canister, but Fisher then escaped. I'm surprised they didn't charge him with three counts of escape. When he escaped, when the gas did not force him out, the court indicated that, or the court indicated there were other arrests when, for example, officers cut the power off. We didn't hear about that. They cut the power off. Was he under arrest when they cut the power off? They seized his house. They seized his power. They seized his ability to see what he's doing. They seized his ability to go on about his life. Was that a seizure when they cut the power? I would say yes. And set off flashbangs. In any event, the final arrest occurred at 2.35 p.m. when Fisher exited and was physically arrested, from which time he did not escape. Summing up its ruling, the court said Fisher continued to go about his business in his apartment. Him doing so was the equivalent of to escape the envisioned by Houdini. We're referring back to the other case. The court then ruled that there was sufficient time to obtain a warrant at least before 1 p.m. arrest. This was because the evidence undisputedly showed that there were enough officers working Fisher's case with the amount of time to obtain a warrant before the police sent in the first CS canister into the apartment. I kind of agree. Thus, the court affirmed the ruling of the trial judge and the jury verdict should be overturned. So, again, they said pesky jurors didn't understand what they were hearing. They were duped. And we are agreeing when the judge overturned it, we're agreeing with the judge. I kind of agree with the court. This decision is fundamentally unsound. There are a variety of reasons for this. Here comes the more lawyering from the DA that probably wrote this. Starting with the glaring failure of the two judges in the majority, named them to dime them out, to comprehend the nature of the incident. Really? I don't comprehend 13 hours out there cutting off the power, throwing in flashbangs? I don't comprehend the incident? The cop to comprehend the nature of the incident. Although the officer certainly had probable cause to arrest Fisher, agree, it is apparent that the preliminary objective was a defused situation, so, has demonstrated by the evacuation of all, so, such a precaution was well warranted, so, considering that from all the appearances, the incident had a potential of ending tragically, so, the cops did good, they evacuated, so what? You cops can't create the exigency. We can't evacuate people and go, hey, there must have been an exigency because we evacuated. I agree with the courts. This DA hasn't convinced me to change my mind yet. Possibly with the deaths of officers and fishers. Oh, here we go. Officer safety. Just consider what the officers knew. Fisher appeared to be irrational and deranged. He was armed with a small arsenal of weapons. In addition, he was seen moving around apartment, loaded, uh, loading at least one of them and pointing it at officers outside the apartment. And then knew that he had threatened to kill people, the police negotiator, in contrast to judges, the dissenting judge, blah, 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 concluded the officers had ample grounds to be seriously concerned about their own safety as well as the safety of the public, particularly since the events took place in an apartment complex. Okay, I'm kind of with him here. There was a danger to the public, and there was significant danger to the officers he had pointed at him. I think they could have entered to take him into custody, but that's not what they argued. Anyway, one reason that Judge Benson Thompson failed to grasp the situation is that you see this DA really calling out the judges, calling them idiots, subvertly. He can't call them idiots to their face, so he calls them in this report. Anyway, one reason that Judge Benson failed to grasp the situation, stupid judges, if the judges who are lawyers with robes on can't grasp the situation, how is a pesky citizen supposed to know all the laws? This is where I get into them, always piss when they go, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, these two judges are ignorant, according to you. The other judge that agreed with them isn't ignorant. The judge that also agreed with the judge that overturned it are ignorant. So everybody's ignorant except the pesky citizen can't be ignorant, or he goes to prison because government shows no mercy. But I digress. Fail to grasp situation instead of considering only the facts known to the officers as they are required to do, saying they violated law because they didn't look at the, they didn't review this case through the eyes of the officers on what they knew at the time. I don't care. 60 officers, you evacuate, you turn off power, you have plenty of time to go to warrant. I, I'm not with you. The DA ain't winning me over on this one. They viewed the situation, their perspective, and that of Fisher. For instance, they began by listing various circumstances the officers could not have known. 
On the afternoon of Saturday, Fisher brought two separate 12 packs of beer. Who cares? I don't care. Settled in his home for the evening watching the World Series cleaning his rifles. So what? I don't care. Approximately 18 World War II firearms. So what? I don't care. Doesn't change anything for me. Thus, the judges set the stage for their decision by insinuating that Fisher was just a regular guy, maybe a history buff, who would settle down. So what? I like it when judges take the side of the pesky citizens. Uh, enjoying an evening of the world saying while cleaning connection of vending guns, the implication, of course, is that Fisher was not actually dangerous and unjustly drawn police standoff. But even in the incident had evolved nothing more than an attempt by officers to arrest a harmless barricade son the judge and Alice would still have been wide off the mark. Why? For one thing, they disregarded the United States Supreme Court instruction on how to determine when police actions constitute an arrest of a suspect located in his place he does not want to leave, such as inside a bus or inside his apartment. In these situations, the court and the suspect were not arrested if a reasonable person is in the position would have felt free to decline the officer's request or otherwise terminate his encounter. So, according to the DA, there's another case law that says if you order a suspect out of his house and he feels free to decline that request, he is not under arrest. Maybe, maybe so. I don't know. I have to read the case. Which case is higher? Which one do we apply? Has, it is explained in U.S. versus Drayton. Drayton. All right. It is a, if a reasonable person would feel free to terminate the encounter, then he or she has not been arrested. I'm not sure this guy could have felt free to terminate the encounter since you surrounded his house, turned off his power, broke his door, threw in a flashbang, and threw in. I'm not sure a reasonable person would feel they were free to terminate this encounter. But this DA obviously thinks he does. If judges Pinson and Thompson had followed Drayton, they would have understood. Man, he's really pissed off at these judges. Uh, under the continuous arrest from the time he became aware that his apartment was sound, probably at 2 a.m., but later, no further than 6.30 when officers ordered him out, it seems rather apparent that a reasonable person would not feel free to terminate the encounter of 60 armed police officers surrounding his home, repeatedly demanding him over to bowl him to step outside and his request to go away and leave him alone. Second, the judges concluded that Fisher was not continuously under arrest because he continued to go about his business. Here, the judges resorted to a blatant speculation like the officers outside the apartment. The judges had no way of knowing that Fisher was doing when he was not visible. Moreover, unless Fisher's business was staying up all night, moving rifles around his apartment, aiming them at officers and dodging flashbangs. How does he dodge a flashbang? He's in his freaking house and you throw it in there. So now it's his fault for dodging the flashbang. You can tell the DA and the government really wants their power and the pesky citizens are always at fault because this guy in his house was dodging flashbangs. Wow. Choking on CS gas, he most certainly did not go about his business. Okay? Ironically, the judges acknowledge the continuing nature of the seizure in the other opinion, giving the barricaded police threats outside intrusion. This is just going back and forth. Third, the judges conclude the suspect inside his home escaped custody when the officers cannot see him whenever they refuse his commands flat out. is preposterous. The judge aptly uh, observed to say that the suspect escaped every time they were out of the view is an analytical nightmare. Gee, like no law enforcement where judges uh, analyze the shit out of what a cop does and what the citizen does. Oh, it's never an ana analytical nightmare. Never for law enforcement agencies. For example, many a bank robbery suspects trapped in a bank escape under the majority's analysis by ducking behind a counter, requiring the officer to obtain a warrant. Okay, he's got a point there. Fourth, although the officers may have not had time to obtain a warrant, officers might have had time. They did. They didn't might to obtain a warrant at some point before Fisher turned. The courts routinely ruled that if the situation was truly exigent and if the officers were diligent in defusing it, a warrant will not be required until the incident is, from all outward appearances, terminated. I don't know what case he's reporting there, but if there is a case that says that, he should argue that in his appeal. For example, if the exigency is a large warehouse and a fire... See, when, when, when judges and lawyers start quoting other cases, it's normally a totally different case and they want to make it seem like this is their case. But we'll see. If an agency of a large warehouse, the court permits arts and investigators to enter the appearances after the fire is completely extinguished, 
to order to determine the cause. But under the procedural of this, the investigators would have to unlawfully enter and obtain a warrant. I wouldn't have a problem with fire investigators getting a warrant before they go in to collect. If you're going in a place to collect evidence, I think you need a warrant or consent or exigency. So, and I don't think after a fire is out, there's an exigency for fire to go and collect. So I disagree with the DA again here. After it was brought in course, certainly before the start of mop up. The incident in this case did not present conceptual, factual, and legal issues, yet the judges lengthy rambled, almost inquired, man, he really hates these judges. And they were so desperate to reach a result, they were willing to ignore the law and engage in wild speculation. A sham, bogus, whatever. The jurors in the case reached a sensible verdict. There was only one arrest, and it occurred at the onset of the incident when exigent circumstances clearly existed. Their verdict should have been upheld. So obviously the DA, because he lost, agreed with the, the, the jury. There's plenty of times where the, G, G, uh, the DA will get up and say, I don't know what the jury was thinking. I don't know how they could have missed it. It was very clear the jury got it wrong. All right, again, all law is up to interpretation. Don't let anybody tell you, I know the law and the law says this and you're good. Because as you can see here, when it comes just to exigency, this is just one small part of law enforcement. When it comes to accident circumstances, if am butts and coconuts rules. All right, pulling that there.